of you. I've looked forward to these events all year because it's an, such an amazing privilege to be in a room full of women, all supporting each other, all growing their businesses, and just sharing information so transparently, which is just incredible. Um, so I thought we could start by actually sharing maybe a little more of our stories and the different perspectives that we bring to this topic. Would you like to go first? Sure. So um, I opened my first restaurant in Philadelphia in 1997, um, Fork, which has just celebrated its um, 26th year in business. Um, and um, I, I was a, I wouldn't say a solopreneur, but I was a small mom and pop shop at that time because that's kind of what the restaurant industry was still in that kind of. Um, preliminary um, small business model. Uh, I, grew, I grew by expanding next door to a 4,000 square foot building where I added a private dining room and I also added a retail space called Fork Etc., which eventually gave way to a business called High Street. And um, that included a full scale bakery uh, as well as um, wholesale bakery, retail bakery, farmers markets, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, in uh, 2013, I, um, with my partner Eli Culp at the time, we expanded to um, A Kitchen and Bar, which is part of a ho hotel group called AKA. There are three in Manhattan, two in DC, t three in Florida, two in California, two in Boston but we only operate the Philadelphia A Kitchen um, in Rittenhouse Square, where we have an operating agreement um, to manage the restaurant. And it's great because um, I highly recommend as a diversific diversification strategy to have a 100% guaranteed uh, financial arrangement. It's really nice because we're incentivized by the sales and by how we perform. Um, so we have that arrangement, and then we also just recently um, closed High Street on Hudson after seven years, which was um, disappointing, but um, unfortunately I learned a lot. And um, after the pandemic, I think with Eli and I both living in Philadelphia, um, it just didn't make any sense anymore. So very sad when I passed by 14th and um, 7th Avenue to see that corner and miss it. Um, and we have now relocated High Street during the pandemic. We, I mean, I will say I have had ups and downs throughout my career of situations that have happened. And one of them was that I had a really um, unfortunate landlord situation and I had to relocate the original High Street that was next door to Fork. We ended up moving in 2020 to a 300 square, 4,000 to 300. And we just did takeout, bakery, farmer's market and um, we just reopened in October 2023, and we were just reviewed yesterday by the Inquirer and really excited about the future of, of our re-envisioned high street. And our last project is um, A Kitchen in wa Washington, D.C., which is opening in April 2024. Wow. Okay, nice. And uh, Ellen and I decided to team up on this segment because we have had the privilege of working together, but Ellen has also been a role model and an inspiration since I was in operations. So this is just, it's really exciting for me to be here with you. Um, and a little bit about my story. So I was originally in operations, found a passion in the people side of the business, so training and ultimately landed in HR, which is kind of ironic because I was a total HR nightmare as a GM. I was like <laughs> never doing the paperwork that was required. Um, but I realized HR is about a lot more than just paperwork, filing forms, processing payroll, and that's the part that I really love. Um, and I think I can bring kind of two different lenses, both through our work with restaurant groups all over the country, supporting their HR, recruiting their teams, but also building our own team. So I run a, a, a consulting and recruiting consulting firm. Now we have about 25 full-time consultants. And this past year, we just were recognized as a great place to work, which is a national certification that uh, comes from a survey that your employees complete. 
So you have no idea how it's going to turn out. And essentially, it basically says that the level of satisfaction of our employees is well above the national average. And there are other um, kind of indicators that go along with that, like higher retention and better productivity and things like that. So I love to share a little bit about our experience building a culture within our team, as well as building a culture within our clients' teams. So we thought that we would start actually with Ellen's story. <laughs> and the theme of this segment is um, building business longevity and scaling up. So what are the different phases that you go through as an entrepreneur who's growing a business and what are the questions that you should be asking at each phase before you kind of proceed to the next? Um, so can you talk a little bit about kind of what you've mapped out here and what hurdles came up for you as you went through each of those transitions? Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. Um, just so I can remind myself what I said. <laughs> I'm going to stand over here for a few minutes. Um, I think that um, you know, over the course of the past um, few years, I've really thought about this a lot because I'm involved with a women's group called Sisterly Love Collective, where we have a lot of women entrepreneurs from all different levels. Some are just starting their own business from the pandemic. Some are like myself, where they were a single operator and wanting to grow to multiple, but not sure how to get there. And then, of course, there are some people in this room who are even more sophisticated than me than I look forward to learning from on how to become a serial entrepreneur, which means that you have some sort of exit strategy. And I think that that goes back to yesterday's conversation with Greg and um, Andy and um, Linda about how do, you, how do you get larger scale financing and take that to grow. Um, so, a solopreneur is somebody who, you know, most of us started this in this industry because we love hospitality or we love culinary. You're, you're a one person shop. Um, I started out, I had a business partner who was a chef. It was she and I, we were basically solopreneurs. And, um, you know, we did have employees because it was a 68 seat restaurant. So of course we had roughly 35 employees, but we ended up splitting up because, um, we didn't see eye to eye on growing. And so that was something I learned very early on in my career is that if you're gonna bring partners on, you have to have a common long-term vision. Sorry, I didn't mean to um, stand in front of you. Uh, you have to have a common long-term vision. And so at that point, we ended up separating. Um, the restaurant was doing really well, so she invested 10,000 and was able to recoup. So that was felt really great, but it begs to, ask because you know once you've had a success the minute that you're out there in the paper what do you think happens people are calling you up emailing you asking you if you want to open another one and you have just gotten your first review and you're you feel overwhelmed because you're like oh maybe i should be considering these because um you know the uh, strike while the iron's hot mentality um, so, you know, I didn't end up growing until seven years after my first restaurant. And that was because every time that somebody would ask me for an opportunity, I didn't have a gen general manager or I didn't have the right chef or I didn't have the infrastructure within Fork to be able to step away from Fork because effectively we were the general manager and chef. And that's the biggest question that so many of the women that I work with in Sisterly Love are asking, when is the right time to grow? When is it the right time to, uh, um, to step away from the thing that you love the most? And it's a spectrum because um, as you move from solopreneur to serial entrepreneur, you are getting farther away from what you truly got into the business to do than you are on your day-to-day -day basis. I mean. I love bussing tables. I am like chief table busser. <laughs> and I have been for 26 years. But that's not my day to day anymore. I mean, I get to like pop in when I love it and pop out when I am needed someplace else. And that's like a luxury for me, I think. You know, who doesn't love being a host 
you know, once in a while, you know, stepping in, seeing your customers give great feedback. That's a great feeling. But understand that when you grow, you suddenly now have other problems that might be bigger than um, whether or not table 55 has to be bust and um, the next table is waiting 20 minutes. Um, and so, you know, when we started, um, that was the first step was when, I when would I be ready to hire on a general manager? Because we built the business where we both could pay, we could afford to pay ourselves, but could we afford to pay ourselves and then afford to pay on top of that um, somebody else? And so that goes back to yesterday and today where we talk about, well, do you have the, cap do you have the savings? Um, you always need to save for a rainy day, although, Many of us didn't think of that before COVID, but, um, and we didn't think the rainy day was going to be um, three years, I guess. <laughs> but, um, but you have to save for a rainy day. And, um, and also, if your vision is to have more than one, and if people are coming up to you, maybe that is your vision to have multiples. Um, so I think that those are the types of things that I, I have been thinking about in terms of what do you need? Step one is probably the financial bandwidth to be able to add on that extra thing, to be able to finance that extra thing. So for Fork, we, we, I'm, 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 I love debt. I'm probably like, unlike all of you, I love debt. I don't want to, I, I had eight investors for High Street on Hudson and it was heartbreaking because although they were all millionaires and probably $100,000 meant nothing to them, um, it was heartbreaking to me to disappoint them because they invested in us to succeed. And when I go to the bank, they don't care. There's no face to the bank. I just write the check and send it to them. And if I, I, I have been in a position where I, I was, um, when I expanded high uh, fork, et cetera, um, the build out turned out to have to be union. So it was a third more than what we expected. And, um, I had to I had to get more money from the bank, and I had to tell them that I couldn't afford to pay the payment that I originally agreed to. And the bank isn't there to take your house. The bank is there to make it work, and they want to know that you want to make it work. So I was able to renegotiate and um, resecure my my collateral and my position, and I got myself out of it. So, you know, it just took longer than maybe I anticipated and it slowed down my ability to grow. But, um, but I love the faceless bank. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. And I've also, um, you know, I was listening to Ping yesterday talk about the waterfall and, um, you know, we structured our arrangement with our investors similar to that. Uh, we put together a deck and um, we had not found our location yet but we had already raised almost a million dollars before we had, um, before we even laid eyes on the corner of, of Hudson and Horatio Street. And, um, and so I've experienced a lot of the things that people were talking about yesterday. The roll up, I just did that. Um, R365, I don't know if you talked about that or not, but I just switched to R365. So I am like on a new leaf for 2024. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Well, one of the things that really stood out to me when we were preparing for this mm -hmm. is we both kept coming back to this central theme of the people, the people that comprise the business, the people that you partner with, and how critical and really kind of make or break that factor can be. Mm -hmm. So going back to the very beginning, uh, when you were starting to build your team, and for, you know, I think there are a good number here who are maybe just hiring your first team or maybe you have one location and you're still trying to figure out who, who are the right people to staff this location. Um, what are some things that you learned that you need from that initial opening team that maybe surprised you or that maybe you didn't anticipate um, that you would kind of share as a word of advice for everyone? Well, one thing I will say is that um, I worked in a restaurant in high school, but I never managed a restaurant. And I never, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, I was a consultant before that, and we just make PowerPoint presentations, basically, as a consultant. <laughs> so I didn't really know how to do anything. Um, so I really had to come at it from the position of, hey, we're building a vision, and I knew 
that it was very difficult to um, keep front of house staff. And so I really leaned on them to try to help create a vision. And because I think it was more inclusive and that became part of our culture to be more inclusive, that was how we were able to um, have the longevity of, of, um, of service that we've had from many of our team members. Mm -hmm. And when you think about either developing and promoting from within or hiring externally, given all the experience you've had, how, how do you approach that differently now? Uh, well, I love seeing, I mean, part of being an entrepreneur, I think, is naturally seeing people that come into your organization, especially in the hospitality industry, grow. So that has always been part of our DNA is to the extent possible we want to hire we, have, we want to promote from within. One of the most difficult things though is when you're a solopreneur, you know, there's only so much room. And I think that after hiring three chefs at that point, I realized if I don't think on a larger scale, I might be going through this process over and over again. Every th three years I'm gonna be stressed out because I'm not a chef also on top of that. I'm, I, really don't know how to do anything. <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I can't step in. I'm always, I'm always in that kind of position where um, I need somebody to help me. So uh, I started thinking to myself, OK, if I, if I have to, um, if I don't want to be in the cycle, I have to change it. I need to start thinking about growing. And of course, I had been approached, and I always wanted to, but I never could. But this time, I'm going to hire somebody who also wants to grow. And so, um, you know, I, I really, um, it was ama I, I don't even know how I met Eli Culp. It was like fi finding a, a needle in a haystack, really. But we really saw eye to eye. I love working with Eli so much. Um, and I think that that started um, our changing our, our outlook on our vision and our mission. Mm -hmm. And I think that segues to the question of partnership, right? In terms of you had a partner that didn't, wasn't aligned from a vision perspective who didn't work out. And then you have Eli Culp who has been a long-term partner and really grown the business seemingly totally aligned with what you envisioned yourself. So. How did you, how, how can you choose the right partner? Mm -hmm. I mean, arguably, that's the most important person that you might bring into your business when you're thinking about growing. What are some of the, you know, tips that you can share in terms of making that decision carefully? Well, it's like finding a spouse, I guess, <laughs> because you are spending all your time with that person. Um, really talking about things. I think setting some ground rules, which is what a partnership agreement is all about, um, is um, you know deciding how you're going to reconcile difficult decisions that you may not see eye to eye on. Making sure that we all know that it's about um, the betterment of our entire team. You know, decisions that we have to make, not about us personally. Uh, I think kind of seeing it that way and really learning about the other person. Um, so some of you might know that, um, that when I brought Eli on, it was an unbelievable, unbelievable chemistry. I love working with Eli and uh, you know, his trajectory as a chef also was incredible at that time. And um, I think one of the most difficult things was that um, when um, we started to grow, um, I think the expectation of, of um, how to build in equity was something that, that wasn't really clear. And so um, we created High Street Hospitality Group so we could grow. And um, I did give him 50% equity because I wanted him to be able to reap any any successes but um, at the same time um, uh, the, because we are we're uh, a different type of organization we have fork and then we have high street hospitality group which is a management company I also wanted him to have 
interest in fork. And because we had been in business already for 15 years, there's a tax issue. You can't just like buy in without putting money in yourself. And so I had to figure out a way to, um, to structure it so that he could get equity. But um, probably others have more clear opinions on how that could happen. Unfortunately, then he was in his accident. Um, he was in a tr the train accident from Philadelphia to New York, and that kind of shifted things. He's still a partner in the business, but more of a silent partner than you know an operating partner. Mm -hmm. We had talked also before about alternatives to actually giving someone equity in a business, and when, when we think about retention from a strategic perspective, I think equity is a buzzword from the tech industry and everyone's everyone on my team is asking when can I have equity and it's like it doesn't exactly work that way in different types of businesses but um, what are other ways that you've managed to retain key members of your team without giving them equity in the business? Well I think that's a great way of phrasing it because equity doesn't necessarily mean that you get more say. You might have equal say um, you know, in making decisions about um, the business as a non-equity holder, as you do as an equity holder. The issue that people don't understand is that becoming an equity holder also means that you may be at risk for, if the company needs money, you may also have to contribute money at some point or um, sacrifice your salary or whatever it, whatever it may take. So being an equity holder isn't always you know, a phenomenal, glamorous, glamorous thing. <laughs> and also, how do you get your equity out? You might get a small distribution on a yearly basis, but maybe you would have made a bigger salary if um, you weren't, you know, an equity holder. I don't know. But, um, but other ways, I think, are incentivizing people based on their performance. So just like I'm incentivized when I work for AKA as the operating partner, it could be based on sales, it could be based on net profit, it could be based on whatever criteria that you decide that um, you want it to be. So for example, um, some of my chefs have been incentivized, so if they manage their labor costs and their cost of goods sold over a certain period of time, they get to get a bonus, um, you know, those type of things. Yeah. And I think, uh, from my perspective, how you structure your compensation incentives, so your bonus program or your ghost equity or whatever you want to call it, it really echoes what your philosophy is as a business or what you want people's focus to be. So it's really not a one-size-fits-all proposition, but it's something to think about, like, how do I want to redirect this person's focus? and give them a stake in some part of the business, whether it's you know cost of goods or building revenue or whatever it might be. Right. Um, you also talked about benefits because you started off with a very generous benefits package, um, from my perspective at least. How did you decide to do that and how did you afford to do that? Uh, I come from a different perspective. My MBA is in healthcare management, and I was um, I worked for Thomas Jefferson Hospital doing primary care network development, and so I really felt strongly that um, people in the hospitality industry are young, but they need to have primary care. And so I came from that perspective, and I tried to sell this idea to all my employees. At that time, healthcare was only $200 a month, or maybe even less, 150 for a premium. Um, and um, I was unable to sell the majority of people on it, um, but I did make people aware, and people were really grateful that they were able to um, sign on to our healthcare program. But at that time, it was just offering the healthcare benefit and explaining to people that it's a tax benefit. So if the premium costs $150, they're basically getting like a third off. Um, so we started with that. We had a 401k simple plan, which most people don't know what a simple plan anymore is, but a simple plan allows you to have um, not be, not have to file all the paperwork, um, and but you have to contribute 3% to everybody and they are automatically vested. So I have people. I never, I never changed my 401k plan, and I still have people from the very beginning. And I look at their savings, and I see how much they've accumulated over 25 years, and I'm really happy for them. 
Um, and also, they were allowed to take loans against their 401k. So those were two really simple benefits. And then we added on a, you know, we had the cafeteria plan because we set up the health insurance plan, which means that you can add on transportation, you could add on cafeteria, uh, children's um, child care benefits. Um, and so, you know, I would, I would explain these to people, but it wasn't until we had formal onboarding until the pandemic hit that people really started wanting these benefits. So we've been offering them for 25 years or so, and um, I would say probably max 15 people might sign up for it, um, but, um, but now we have a much larger roster of people. Yeah. So we, we also cover 50%. In, in the beginning then, was it not as much of a financial factor, I guess, in terms of budgeting for benefits, or did you still have to make some compromises to offer health insurance, to offer 401k? I mean, those are, they're not, ben I'll just say speaking from our clients that we've worked with, they're not standard benefits in right, our industry. Right. So how did you make that work financially? Um, I think that, um, that I included it in my original startup, so I was expecting it to be an operating expense. I didn't know how many people would sign on, and because we were theoretically not paying for it, um, I was just paying for the administration of it at the very beginning. But it, you know, as we grew, on, grew, I mean, I would say maybe five years in, we started adding, you know, you get this this much insurance benefit, and then of course when ACA started becoming a thing. We increased our um, contribution and, you know, and took away the choice. Right. <laughs> I actually I wanted to skip forward here because I think this is relevant. Um, I wanted to provide a broader perspective on the different layers of benefits. So it's really hard to know where to start with benefits, and it can be a, a one of the more significant costs when it comes to uh, labor and all of the things that go along with that. So, you know, when we approach it, especially with a new business, there are some fundamental building blocks that we would always recommend having in place first, which you can kind of see at the bottom layer there. And then as you grow, as your business becomes more sophisticated, as you have more financial means, layering benefits on top of that. I think the challenge sometimes is just feeling like you have to do all of it at once because you see the restaurant on the corner that's offering this very robust benefits package and the reality is that's not always financially feasible and it takes a lot of time to administer all of those benefits and to, to your point actually even educating your team so they understand them so they see a value in enrolling with them right. takes mm -hmm. a lot of time. Um, so going back here, there are some challenges that um, traditionally come along with people in the hospitality industry specifically. And I wanted to dig into like where you've seen some of those pitfalls show up for you in your business. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about overburdened managers specifically mm -hmm. as this huge hurdle, especially when you're starting off, you're overburdened, then you hire someone, then they're overburdened until you hire someone else. So maybe focusing on that issue specifically, how do you know when it's time to bring another leader onto your team and then another one after that? That's a great question. Um, I don't even think this is working. Sorry, <laughs> um, it's okay. Uh, I, I, unless anyone can't, if anybody can't hear me, um, I think that um, uh, first of all, the mental health of your management team is really important. The um, the mental health of your of your management team is really important, and um, you know at some point you're going to realize that you know, if they're working consistently 12 hour days or more, mm -hmm. that's not sustainable. And so you know, n people don't want to work for an employer anymore that requires that. I mean, it used to be in the old days that it was expected that you would be working 12 hours a day. But now it's expected that you're working 
eight, maybe nine hours a day, and um, you know, occasionally maybe ten hours a day. So you know, based on just your, if, if it's a restaurant, it's shift coverage, right? Um, and um, you know, just making sure that being you can be creative about it. I mean, like not everybody has to be a full fledged manager to to make the business operate. I, I I talk to my team about this all the time. Is that you could this is a way to train people up is at opening do you have to be there for the like slowest time of the morning or can you empower one of your you know more more you know senior servers to take over mm -hmm. um, so I think that there are ways to be creative and to um, give responsibility to people who might not necessarily officially be managers. Maybe you pay them a dollar more hourly or something like that, or you know, during the period of setup, they get X, Y, or Z. Um, maybe you cover their health insurance in some way. Um, I think you can be more creative. Yeah. And I would add, actually, from my own perspective with my business, there's always an element of ego in relinquishing control of the things that either you feel you're especially good at or the things you love to do. And so, um, and I think that's been kind of a theme actually over the past two days is just recognizing that in order to really properly support and serve the growth of your team and your business, you need to put your own ego and your own enjoyment sometimes, honestly, to the side in order to hand that over to people who might even be more capable than you are. Like, I look at my team today and I say, why didn't I do this sooner? <laughs> you know, so I, I think that's a really big point and it's a very scary place to be. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, certainly once you pass that threshold, you feel like you should have done it a lot sooner. Absolutely. Um, I would wholeheartedly agree with that because there's a lot of things I love to do, but again, um, my time could be spent better. And um, in fact, it's enabled me to do even more. I mean, I would never be able to do Sisterly Love Collective if I was managing the restaurant full time. I mean, that just wouldn't be possible. So I, I wholeheartedly agree. There are a lot of things that I love to do, and I, I, I know that maybe. Um, I don't want to give it up, but in the end, I'm happier when I've given somebody else the opportunity to do it. And guess what? They might not do it the same way as you. And I think that's one of the, the hardest things to give control up of is, um, you know, there are a thousand ways to get things done. And if you're unwilling to accept any other way than your way, then you might not be able to, you might not be a candidate for wanting to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one other point I wanted to ask you to share is we've talked about all the ups and downs that you've been through over the years and even in, in the seven years that we've been in business, we've basically shut down and rebuilt. Mm -hmm. um, and all of you have, right, because of the pandemic. So how do you find that resilience in yourself and for your team to continue operating for 25 plus years? <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's just sheer will. <laughs> um, I, you know, I love what I do. And I think probably most of you are here because you love what you do. And you want to figure out how to like keep doing what you're doing. And I just don't accept that there's not a solution, except Sometimes you have to. I mean, like Hudson Street, as much as I loved it, I, I could not sustain coming up here in 2020 or 2021. It just would have not, it would have sunk our whole company because I have four businesses in Philadelphia and one business here. If I had to restart High Street on Hudson from like, and everybody left, chef, servers, managers, I mean, like restart the entire business from scratch, there was no way I could do it. But I had the support in Philadelphia, and that's what enabled me to, to survive. So I had to let one go to keep the rest. Yeah. One of the other things you talked about was empowering your team. And you've always kind of brought them into the decision making, I think, as much as possible. Um, and I think a lot of resilience comes from that as well, because then you're not sharing the, the burden yourself. 
you're bringing other smart people into the decision making process into the problem and kind of solving the problem together mm -hmm. um, and I think that that form of culture or kind of transparency decision making can be really really powerful um, are there other elements of your culture specifically that you feel have contributed to your your longevity? Well, I think that um, one thing is that we may not, uh, first of all, we are not the highest paying company out there. So there's something about the culture that is attractive to people. And I think that the culture has to be something that really is true. Um, you know, I was just having this conversation with somebody and, and we were talking about a toxic environment and what is a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's when you say you're something and you're not something. And I was just like, mm -hmm. I don't know if I would define that as 100% a toxic environment because we're all evolving to try to be what our mission is. I mean, it's aspirational. It's not we are because we're always trying to improve. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that um, uh, and I, I, I think that um, that keeping that in mind um, and moving forward is what has attracted people, and they see the opportunity for growth. They see the op they see that we care about their careers and about them growing. Those are the things, the intangible things that are more valuable than money. Um, you know, sharing in all the victories, sharing in the problems, making them feel like they are true owners of the business, um, although they may not truly be equity holders, I think has been the thing that makes them feel um, that they can sacrifice yeah. turning something down. And, and, you know, our values, I think, is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, one of the other things I wanted to highlight, which I think is very much on this theme, is the role of understanding how your business is doing and steering your long-term growth. And there are a lot of different <coughs> data that you can look at to understand that. But for me, I think the most valuable is employee sentiment. And I don't know how, do any of you do employee sentiment surveys? A few. It's so powerful because how else will you understand what you need to change to better engage your team? And your team is what drives your revenue, your margin, mm -hmm. your guest experience. So I think if, if you are not already gathering insights from your team, and it doesn't have to be a survey, it could be round tables, it could be a coffee break with your staff, um, starting to do that can be really, really important. Um, actually, we just started doing um, uh, lunch with me <laughs> and um, so we have everybody in the company sign up everybody you have to sign up for lunch at and we take you to one of our restaurants and um, hear about what are your challenges what you know what do you like about the company what do you think could be improved and actually it it produced a lot of positive positive um, feedback as well as things that we could definitely work on and um, you know, I, I, I think check-ins are really important. Um, you know, I used to be like, oh, I don't have time. A quarterly performance is, in, is enough. But I think the current generation of hospitality workers, they want feedback and they want to give feedback. And so it's really important, even though some of the things you might not want to face or hear, it's really an opportunity to, um, you know, hear whether it's a trend or a one-off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'll highlight, I mean, we've done more and more of these over the years, and I think, um, I think employers are starting to realize how important this is, and employees have a voice more now than ever before, and they're going to tell you what's missing. I promise. So give them a positive venue to do that, rather than waiting until it explodes in a really unproductive way. Um, but we recently went through this with a client that's been around for many years. They're very successful CPG brands that a lot of you would recognize, female-led, based here in New York. And for the first time ever, they did an employee engagement survey. The things that came out of that survey were so easy to fix. It was like, 
we have an unlimited PTO policy, but I don't actually know how much PTO is okay to use. Well, okay, let's clarify the policy. It's these really simple nuts and bolts that actually impact people's happiness at work. So I would say don't be afraid of what will come out of those conversations. It's probably not as challenging as you think to address some of those things. Um, okay, maybe we'll pause for questions. You know, I think for me, what, what is so interesting about our conversation leading into this is obviously the theme of this whole workshop is financial literacy. But so much of your success as a business involves tying all of that together through your culture, through your team, um, and really disseminating that as your business grows. So um, any questions Ellen and I would, would welcome, or even if you'd like to share your own experience, yeah. It's like, I just find it hard, because we try to have an open door policy and all that, like, I'm, you know, very close, uh, open to talk to my employees of all, all the levels in the company, but I find it often, I feel like I'm in a therapy session, you know, I'm not a therapist. Like, so how do you set those boundaries of that, because I feel that um, it's hard for them um, I'm like this is you know this is not this is not work appropriate stuff or like yeah well, how can you set those healthy boundaries of that you have that open door policy that you want to talk to them but also the timing of when they come talk to you is it's like yes. anytime yes. it's like really yes. right now right you know what I mean? so, yeah um, I mean I'm literally like okay yes I will talk to you you can schedule a meeting. Right. Because I really can't do this every day, just in passing. Yeah, right? <laughs> an open door policy does not mean you can come bitch at me whenever you want to, yeah. like 100%. So, but I think how you respond to those inquiries or those approaches mm -hmm. is what creates that culture of openness. So yeah, please make an appointment I'm so grateful that you thought about sharing that feedback with me. It's a little bit of both, I think. Um, and building structure around those meetings. So like, here's what I would like, here's how I'd like this meeting to go. Here's what would be most helpful to me as the leader of your business. I would like to leave with some actionable suggestions that you have to make our team better. So we want to orient it around solutions rather than complaints. Um, and I think that can be really helpful. There should be some other venue potentially for them to vent and complain that's not to you because your time should really only be focused on making the business better and more productive. Yeah. To kind of piggyback off of that, I think this room is unique. If this room was men, yes. I'm curious if yes. we would be talking about employees coming with uh, issues, but. I get asked a lot if I, can I sit down with you? And it's not work related. They're not, they're not bringing something up that has anything to do with anything I can control. They are literally looking at an adult and they have an issue and they're serious issues. So it's really hard to balance, like how do you? Can that be the mom? Yes, and it's like some days I'm frustrated by it because I'm like I don't I can't emotionally take on other like I'm a business owner I have, it's already a lot, but you also I feel like we have a lot of pressure to be that person for all of our employees yeah. and it, it's it's a lot and how do you set boundaries without seeming like you're shutting a door in somebody's face? It, I just don't think men deal with that because they get away with not having to, but we don't. If we were to not address something with an employee, I feel like it would come back to haunt us at some point. It does. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would just say, and I, I'd love to have you share your input on this, but I would say, remember when you put that emotional labor into those conversations, that is what makes you a good employer. That is what makes a difference. And the male boss who's not having those conversations, people are leaving. So I know in the moment, you're like, this is exhausting. And I have my own total bucket of problems. But having the time to really sit and care about someone does make a big difference. 
Yeah, it's it's really hard because um, uh, you know, there are, as you grow, you have more and more employees who want to speak to you, but actually you have managers in between also. And so um, sharing that responsibility with your management team, um, I think also helps. And, and also, um, you know, I, I do want to help everybody who has a problem, but, um, but I also know that I'm not an expert in anything. And so sometimes just finding a resource to help that person is the easiest way to kind of um, you know, keep it moving forward. Yeah, yeah, we um, just, Last night when I got home, I had an email from a client about um, basically a sexual harassment issue that had escalated and the male employee who was accused was fired on the spot but ended up leaving and vandalizing the car of the female employee and it was this whole thing. And you know, it's tough in HR because I think the tendency is to say, that's someone's personal problem once it's outside of the restaurant. It's not really something we should be advising them on. But again, I think the different, differentiator for you potentially as a business owner who cares is to actually cross that line a little bit within your expertise, but to say, here's a resource that could help you, or here's like a common sense piece of advice that I'll share without my business owner hat on, but just as a good person. So you know, I think that that line has definitely changed over the years. Yeah, and I also think that when people come to me with a problem, being calm about it and being just very businesslike about it, even though I'm not, I'm, I do want to help and I want to hear what your problem is, but just keeping it very well, you know, um, here's maybe you should go talk to Southern Smoke or maybe you should, maybe you know, this person's parents just had a fire and she lost everything you know, we're gonna put together a, a GoFundMe and then I can have one of my, you know, leaders help mm -hmm. put that together. Mm -hmm. But don't you have to be concerned about, like, stepping over that line that uh, it could technically, like she was saying, be used against you? Um, yeah, it becomes a liability. So it's like, because now we're stepping into, and I think that crossing that line is stepping into now, I am also a resource to help you in your life. Mm -hmm. And then that line gets, because I work with my husband. I get all of the, Queenie, I'm not able to pay my rent. Well, what do your finances look like? That's not, you know, that's not, that's not my problem. Like, I'm paying what we're, we're able to pay. Or, mm -hmm. Queenie, my boyfriend broke up with me. Can I have a hug? Like, all of those types of things where naturally, as a human being, I'm very well accepting. And I think that between, because I was like, I was, in 2023, I was the campaign of let's heal the world, let's heal our employees, and it came back and bit me in the ass big time. And, and so now I'm trying to really find that happy medium of like, number one, I don't want to get too invested because now my mental health is all over the damn place with trying to help facilitate these people because I do care. And so I, like, I think that, they, I mean, I don't know, everybody else, we're in California, I'm afraid to say anything like, well, maybe you should go. Well, she advised me to go over there, and I was abused, and then now it's my fault. Yeah. Like, you know, so so it's like, I it's, think it's the a, managers is a great buffer, but it's like, how 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 do we not put ourselves in a liability to to one mess up our mental health, and now we're spiraling out of control? But also, I don't know, should HR create like a little lane for just that we just throw them over, not throw them over there, but like send them <laughs> over there. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's too much, I think. I think yeah. that's what everybody's kind of saying. Like, it's a little bit too much. Yeah, I think, I think it's a dance and there's a line that's not super clear in terms of what's okay and not okay to help with. So I think that it's a very personal decision and it's a jurisdiction by jurisdiction decision because let's be honest, like I can say whatever I want in Texas. I can't do that in New York or California. So I think it's a little bit of both, but really following your intuition in terms of the type of culture you wanna create from that generosity perspective, um, like generosity of support and generosity of care. Um, but also, what you said is so spot on, caveat everything with what is it within your expertise and what isn't, mm -hmm. right? I've never been through this situation before, but here's something that you might consider doing, or 
I've never been through this situation and I'm not gonna help you, but here's an organization that can help you. So I think it's figuring out like what feels the most aligned with your own capabilities, with your own needs as a business owner, like put your oxygen mask on first philosophy. And then also what, you know, how sensitive is the liability in your specific area? I was just gonna say that one of the, um, we didn't really get to talk about this, but health insurance isn't the only um, model. There are like other types of companies that offer mental health benefits as well. And so by being part of, by offering health insurance, we also got this free telemedicine thing. So anyone in the company can call the telemedicine um, and also there's a um, employee assistance program. So if you can't pay your rent, you can call this number up and they will give you resources to help. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes I, I'm, I'm not qualified to do anything. I, 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 you know, I don't know how to cook. I don't know how to, take you know. To <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I, tell, I tell all my team members, like, you know, I might not be able to give you the best advice because I just don't know, but here's, but I'm happy to listen to what you have to say, and th this is what I, th this is somebody you could turn to yeah. to get some free advice. Yeah, I and I have to say it with our team all the time too. Like, you want to help, which is wonderful. We're not tax advisors. We're not accountants. I know that you know something about taxes, and you want to tell your client about it, but we don't. Like, you really have to be careful about that from a liability perspective, mostly. So I do think it's a good flag to bring up that like you have to know your limitations and you're not going to be an expert in everything. You can care and empathize, but you're not going to solve everyone's problems. And in fact, you shouldn't because it's it may not be the best use of your time and you might steer them in the wrong direction. We have another. Did you have a question? Yes. I do have a question. Um, this comes from a slightly different perspective. So by any chance, do you know what a CVI is, the core, um, the core values index, or the insight? So mm -hmm. core value insight, um, so previously in my last partnership, we implemented this from a other consultant where it kind of helps, <coughs> it helps your hiring process. Mm -hmm. It helps um, pinpoint who you need in certain positions. So think of like, I need an immersion breaker, I need someone that's thinking in this perspective, so I need them in a, an administrative role. So you, of course, your creative people, which most of us here, if you're pastry chefs or chefs, we are imaginative. Like we are certainly things that we have because we're going through this entrepreneurial process. We don't want to have the passion. So I, I well, since you don't know anything about it, I guess my kind of my question is kind of invalid now. But I was going to ask, do you think that is a something that you should be looking into or would you suggest using that model while hiring employees mm -hmm. so that we have a better insight of where to put people, are they valuable in this place, will they get bored? Because you don't want someone that is a creative in an administrative role because they're gonna get bored, they're gonna get tired, and they're gonna start to have issues mm -hmm. if yeah. you don't have that creative outlet. It's a good question. I, while I'm not familiar with that specific one, I am, have used lots of different personality assessments, aptitude tests. I mean, when, when I was at Hillstone, we gave every single employee an aptitude test and a personality test. And we actually weren't allowed to hire someone who didn't score a certain way. So, you know, is there value? I think that um, there are a lot of, I guess, detractors who believe that those tests are very, um, they kind of boil someone down to a statistic and that feels really gross. Um, but I think that can be a valuable tool. So um, I'll share like what we do with our team is we have everyone who's new, who's already been offered a position, they complete a personality test that's like, it's more fun than serious, but then they share it with the team and it's their way of saying, here's who I am, here are the things that help me work effectively, here are the things I might struggle with, and it's the interpretation I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, so we have other clients who have done disc assessments. We, you know, there are a lot of different tools like this, and um, while I think they can be a little bit dangerous if you reduce your hiring decisions just to that, I do think that they can help 
potentially flag some concerns or give you something, give you direction. Like here's something you might want to dig into a little bit more in your actual conversations with that person. Can I just add to that because we use that under a previous HR person at JBF, we did all discuss tests when after after uh, starting, and they're 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 fun to do. It's great to see how you compare it to your team, to your colleagues, but then if there's no follow up with this, it feels very useless. So it feels like it's something that should be part of a plan where there's action afterwards or there's follow up quarterly. Like what do you do with that information besides the first ten minutes you look at it? Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it's one data point in someone's performance or someone's orientation as a person that can help you manage them on an ongoing basis. So I do think, I totally agree, it's a lot of fun. And then if you don't do anything with it, what value are you getting out of it? So using it, for example, with us, every new project we start, the team discusses their personality types, what do they want to work on? What might be some challenges for them? So that in that group, everyone now understands kind of how they tick. Um, and so, you know, that might be something similar if you're opening a new restaurant, for example, and you want to use that as a team building exercise for people to talk about, again, kind of how they operate. Um, but yeah, I agree. It's, an, it's just like employee surveys. You can't just do the survey and then say, oh, that was interesting. <laughs> you have to actually share your findings and, and act on your findings. Otherwise, that whole exercise can actually really destroy morale. We'll do one more question back here. Yeah. Um, so Stephanie was saying earlier that. Can you speak sorry, up a bit? So, um, earlier, Stephanie was saying during her presentation that she finds that a lot of companies don't bring in HR early enough. And as someone who is in the early stage of starting the food business, um, I guess what would you advise, um, like at what point to establish, like say, a handbook you know, or something like that, even if it's a really small business with very few employees just to, I guess, protect oneself mm -hmm. and the business. And also, <coughs> more for Ellen, um, like um, in terms of investing in your employees, how did you establish kind of a baseline for what's forgivable behavior and where some things like immediate grounds for dismissal? Like, do you have a standardization? Is it always case by case? Like, someone who's caught stealing or perceived stealing, maybe a too many shift drinks or something like that. Like, if you want to retain them because they are valuable in other ways, like, how do you how do you know where to keep investing? Or there's too many customer customer complaints, and say at this point it's not working. Well, to answer your first question about um, HR, when to bring HR in. So first of all, having an employee handbook is mandatory on the day that you hire your first mm -hmm. employee. Because you need to set the tone for, uh, we, use it, we use the employee handbook not only as a, um, a, a, uh, an informational sharing uh, tool, but we also use it to set standards of behavior and what's tolerable and intolerable. We have a whole section that says these behaviors may be grounds for immediate termination. And we go through like a list of 25 things, bringing a weapon to work, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like, you know, it could be anything. It could be um, misutilizing um, somebody, somebody was taking coffee. Um, and gr grinding the coffee and putting it into a bag and then putting it into their um, take-home bag. I'm like, I'm not the coffee shop. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm like a business, you know what I mean? Even though that sounds minor, but like, that is like, th that is th if they're doing that, where else are they be you know, behaving in that way, stealing? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's really important to set the tone for that. It also says what to do if you need to call out sick. Um, how to apply for PTO, how to um, you know get your paycheck, when to get your paycheck. Like we don't allow people to get their paycheck during certain hours because we're in business and we don't want a whole line of people coming into the office, you know, trying to get their their check. So you know we outline every expected behavior so that um, we are 
letting you know what our expectations are. And I think that's, that's the most important thing. I met Sarah from listening to her speak at FAB, and I immediately was in love with Sarah and Empowered Hospitality. And I immediately was just like, I need this woman to be part of my team. And um, that was in 2018, I think, that... Um, that I think so. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And, and it started with asking her team to just review our manual and um, make sure that it was in compliance which they did. Um, and um, you know, this morning, my first call of the day was with Sarah's team because we had a, a, we had a snafu. Um, it was kind of a major snafu, but, um, but you know, it, it's, there are different ways to work with HR, and I think you can get creative in that regard and figure out what fits best for your stage of, of business. Mm -hmm. um, what was the last <sighs> second half of that? Well, I think that the more you create standardization, the more you're creating just a cadence and an expectation for, for how people should behave. And so, you know, the biggest thing I learned when I first opened was I felt a lot of servers didn't feel that people, that people respected them as professionals. And so that's why I started creating, making the tone of it, this as to make our business more professional, that this is why we have a, a manual, this is why we're doing quarterly reviews. Um, I created a evaluation form that says, okay, greets a table in two minutes. Um, brings water, um, does side work, comes to work on time, you know, where I rated everybody from one to five, and we, it, w it wasn't used to decide whether they were getting a raise because they were all tipped employees, but explaining to them what, um, where they needed to grow and where they could use constructive um, improvements. And then for the back of the house, also creating ranges. So, so a garmage cook makes from 14 to 18 dollars per hour this is what the job duties are so having job descriptions that clearly outline what's expected and um, you know how you're being measured and then once you achieve that then it depends on whether there's an opening or not I, we can't just you know keep you know paying the garment garment cook um, more and more and more for not, for doing the same job over and over again. So you have to be increasing your ability and your contribution to the company to um, to be able to get a pay raise. Are there any cases? I think that's the question. Where if someone is stealing from you or having too many shift drinks, but they are they score five on all your points, for example, it's worth keeping them, or do you just cut the cord if they are doing things that are detrimental to your business ultimately or to the spirit of the team? Right, the person who was taking the coffee had been there for, um, I want to say, probably five years, and it was heartbreaking. But um, you know, if if this is one of the things that was outlined, unfortunately, as much as I didn't want to make that decision, we made that decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a, a, a huge thing. Sorry, Stephanie, you just wanted to oh, jump I in. Just, I just want to add to what you're <laughs> saying, and this is not any industry; it's not just the restaurant industry. Like low, when you keep either a low performer or somebody who's not doing the right thing within your organization and you keep them on because of something else, you're really hurting the rest of your team because your team sees, your team knows who the low performer is. Your team knows who's the person who's not doing the right team. And it just, the morale of your organization, just it trickles down. So it could be really painful but it's always, more often than not, the right thing to do. I would say 99.99% of the time, it's the right thing to do. Yeah, I would also say in the, in, the, in the beginning, sometimes it feels like loyalty is the best quality in an employee. You're like, oh, you've been through the trenches with me, and you've been here for five years, and it's a major, major hurdle that I see with a lot of the businesses we work with where you overvalue loyalty and you ignore 
what actually determines performance, which is, do you follow the rules? Are you a good teammate? You know, those things that could lead to potential disciplinary issues. So just, you know, word of caution. And I think it's a great example, Ellen, that employee who had been around for five years but was really um, doing something that ethically violated what the business stands for. You have to be kind of absolute about those things. I mean, we're going to close it here. I'm so sorry, but we're already over time. I want to make sure we have time for the office hours. Thank you both so very much. Thank you.